Hi, it's me, Neil Brennan. You're watching the Blocks Pack. Oh, God damn it. Let's just I leave blew it. it. I Let's blew just... it. No, I know, but I blew it. And it I feel... in front of one of my heroes. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, I talk about this guy every episode. Uh, he's the Pater Familia. For, is that right? Is that the yeah. thing? Uh, he, it's, all this is his. He's the exec producer. Not credited. You'll get no money. <laughs> oh, I had a bit where I was going to hand you a, a <laughs> envelope, and I forgot to do it. Yeah, uh, one of the best come on, uh, one of the best comedians. Another fuck. I'm really in my head about this. One of the best comedians doing it. Mansplaining. If you're not aware, it's when a man tries to explain what you already know in a patronizing manner. <laughs> it's when a man. It's me. <laughs> tries to put clever, clever thoughts into your pretty little brain. And a great man. Easy for you to say. Well, a great man in terms of uh, been a friend, like literally not only like gave me the idea, but been a friend, defended me, uh, and stood on uh, with with me in various times, and a true uh, resource in terms of just comedy and pitching and all that stuff. It's Jimmy Carr, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, yes. I, I, it's, a, it's such a pleasure to be here. I've loved the show. Yeah, I've absolutely loved it. Like, it's, there are people that watch the show that always has notes. Basically, every episode when we were talking about the carrot top episode, for instance, I love it. I, it just feels like it's a very interesting kind of space to come on, and you know, because Blocks is such a it's a great special, right? And it feels like everyone uh, in comedy could have written something like that, could have been that open, yeah, about their mental health and their life, and they aren't, and maybe it leaks through a little bit. I think comics leak. Yeah, you watch an hour special with me. It's just it's I'm a joke to joke comic, and that's an insecurity that we'll get onto later. I feel <laughs> sure in this, but the idea if you go, I never feel like I'm enough. I always yeah. feel like I, I just need jokes. I don't want to waste anyone's time. I'll just get to the next thing. They're not interested in me. They need to laugh. They've come here for a reason. I'm providing a service, and that's great. But the idea with blocks that you kind of you open up and talk about what's really going on with you, and then you you make it. I mean, it's hilarious. It's a yeah. hilarious special. But that thing of like coming on and sharing that, it's it's interesting, right? I think it's the most interesting. I'm worried that it's everything's pathologized now, and everything is like my trauma and my uh, and well, the, I mean, the trauma bit in in the new one is yeah phenomenal yes thank you but now i'm worried not like i'm on the wrong side of it but it's so it's like for instance everyone said i'm rick james bitch and you kind of feel like ugh. no you, after you, a you while just, you were just too close to it i think sometimes when you're too close to it when you're in the zeitgeist uh you you can't see it you, you know i could see it, but i it just felt like it was being ruined by the wrong people so i feel like in a way trauma is being overly used i think great right. no no I one think, has right. let's, let's overcorrect Let's have a correct because no one was talking about it. There is a mental health crisis in the world, mm -hmm. and you know you, look, you only have to look at you know young people committing suicide. There's terrible things happening out there. Yeah, the people opening up and talking about what it's like to be a human being seems like a very very healthy thing to do. Not a huge part of your childhood, uh, not a big part of mine, or indeed our adolescence and and kind yeah. of you know lives beyond. So this is all very healthy. Great, and I feel like I was there pretty early, so yeah. I can stand on it. Sure, really. but I do. I have no. I have made a point of talking about like post-traumatic growth as like, no, you can grow, you can grow from these things. Yeah. And there is obviously a lot of upside to feeling like you're well, not enough. One of the smartest things you ever said to me was there's not one type of therapy. What therapists should have to tell you by law in the first session is there are other types of therapy available. This isn't it. Because I don't really see the point in going to Freudian analysis for 20 years to find out it was all your mother. Yeah, you could, which yeah, but, you knew. But what am I going to do with that? Yeah. Well, what do I do about it? How do I grow talk corn? Talk to me about it and I'll charge you. Yeah, let's get on to blocks. I want to talk, a, but I want to talk about a little bit about how Jimmy and I, when we're in Montreal for the comedy festival, which is about six days, we go on, they're pretty romantic walks. I would say, yeah, I would say if you, were, about, if, if you were remaking Brokeback in the modern age, you would go on a very long walk and eat a nice vegan meal and discuss comedy and life. That's yes. That's all there is, right? Yes. And sure. it's philosophical, and they're long walks, so we burn the calories. I put down the vegan sword, and we get Dairy Queen. We they are long. There's up a hill. There's down the. It's the whole it's, thing in the most beautiful city in the world. I can't understand why more people don't go to Montreal for a holiday, for a vacation. I agree because you go. Well, what do you want from a vacation? You want fun. Mm -hmm. You want to have a laugh. 
You want maybe a few drinks and nice weather. Well, and Montreal's got all of it. And you can see the best comedians in the world. And, and you can meet them. You can see yeah. them. See them. I mean, they're, they're, they're there hanging around. If you're super into comedy, it's like, it's the place. It, because it's an invitational. Like the Edinburgh Festival is phenomenal in Scotland, but some people are having a bad time. Not yeah. everyone is winning. And they may not be great at comedy. But everyone is winning in, in Montreal. It's invitation only. Every, I mean, it might not be your thing. I was thinking that thing with comedy. If you watch a, a successful comedian and they're not doing well, it's because it, it's not for you. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. Don't try not to sweat it. They're doing something that's not for you. You will, three of the, at least three, if not eight of the best comedians in the world will be in Montreal every year. Yeah. So have fun. It's, it's pretty good. That's a good holiday tip for people. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, this is a strong podcast. Yeah. Uh, we're already doing a yeoman's work. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like you do, you do your, sh you'll do roast. You'll do, it's like people doing a bunch of things. You, well, you I've do, seen some I always think the, the magic of Montreal is you do stuff you would never do anywhere else. If someone else said to me, oh, do you want to go and roast someone at one in the morning yeah. after you've already done two shows? So you go, well, well no. Is, it, is, there, is there money changing hands? No, it's going to be, it's free, just for fun. Ah, no, I'm going to go home. But in Montreal, you, yeah. Of course. Where's the hang? Yeah. You know, everyone's going to be there. Or, gonna be or Jeff Ross and David Teller doing bumping mics or something. You go, do you yeah. want to just hang in the audience? Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's a great time. You, we've also, well, I, I consider you like a resource of friendship, meaning like you're, you're very good counsel. Oh, well, that's very nice of you to say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I feel like you feel that about me and you're, you don't want to say it. Uh, no, that's, I was, I was waiting, but it's that thing of, yeah, it is, it feels like if I just fire the compliment back at you. It's, uh, it's I love you too. But it is that, yeah, it is that thing where I do go to you for advice on things because you've got an incredible um, ability with friendship. Very few people do it like you in terms of you go, you do, we do very little small talk. Everything seems to go yeah. straight into kind of quite emotional depth. And there's a level of honesty that's incredibly unusual. I think it's, you know, it's one of the things that you go, you're... Uh, and we'll come on to talking about this later, maybe. But the your um, belief in fairness mm -hmm. is it cuts through everything. It's ruining my life, but yes. Yeah. Well, anything taken to a hundred percent becomes. <laughs> I mean, justice taken to a hundred percent. It's end a up with, recipe for disaster. Four moves away from Stalin. It's you know. Yes. No. I, I I've come to that realization recently. Where I'm like, this is you are dedicated to your own misery. Um, okay, so let's talk more about. Before we get into this, you we're both very aware of how well our lives are going. I just don't want yeah. people to think that you're like complaining I, or anything. I think the I mean my thing is the uh gratitude for me is the mother of all virtues. Gratitude allows everything else in. So it's not just gratitude for kind of your life in the oh well I'm glad I've got this show tonight with people coming. You go, Well, I'm glad to be a comedian. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be living in this era. I mean, I do think it's the golden age of comedy. And as we're walking in, we're talking about like the Beatles, like being the first band. They got to do everything first. I feel like we're at that stage of stand-up comedy. Yeah. So it's a very new medium. feels like it's an American medium. Maybe you could stretch American Jewish medium, really the, the language of it. And the idea that it's just coming up now and you have these incredible voices, Carlin and Pryor, uh, Rock and Chappelle and Louis C.K. and Bill Burr, and these kind of voices coming through that you go, well, this is going to be, um, it, it's... It feels like it's such a privilege to be in this world now. Well, it also is a new, it's like the Beatles were the first rock band, but music's been present for, I don't know, I, 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 like Time written music. I mean, written music, let's say yeah. 1500, 1400, 1500, whatever. I don't even know when it is, but uh, comedy is it's a new genre. I don't think it's a genre of something. No, it's a whole- Like rock and roll was a genre of music. I wouldn't say spoken comedy. That's it's, it's from really, 1940, 1950. Yeah. It's, it's, there's that great, uh, what's he called? Cliff, um, Huxtable? No. <laughs> Cliff, who's the guy that wrote the book, The Comedians? Oh, Cliff Nesseroff. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fabulous book. Yeah. I mean, really. And he's got a new one also. Outrage. Yeah. Yeah. Where Fantastic it's like writer. contextualizing comedians getting in, canceled and in trouble. Well, it's that thing where you go, I, I, I view this uh, like in micro and macro. I kind of think like the idea that cancel culture is a problem is sort of horseshit. And you go, but but in a in a golden age, everything looks yellow. So you you know, America and comedy, it's never been objectively better, but subjectively worse. Say more. So the idea and I travel around America on this tour and I go to different and this is the land of milk and honey. It is yeah. so fantastic. And to perform comedy here, I mean the crowds are so up and 
everyone seems to be having a great time. It's the the great places to eat, great places to live. Yeah. Like ten cities you could very happily live in that are just yeah. great. And yet subjectively, oh, everything's terrible. We're, you know, I think there's, that there's a civil war going on. You go, well, okay, but compared to other places, this is yeah, this, this is, is not great. a real civil war. And and uh, I'll tell you what was terrible: the civil war. Um, yeah. And then comedy, like there's a lot of, I think the downside with comedy is you're constantly looking at what everyone else is doing. And so you're looking over, oh, well, what? hang on, maybe I should have a huge podcast. Well, that's, you're fine. Do, do your thing. Yeah. I'm trying to be more stoic. I'm trying to do less better. I think it's a really nice, like, don't Accepting, do- Accepting, well, the thing that I want to, I, I, I got do... it from this. I got it from this, this podcast. I was listening to Pete Holmes on this. It's a great episode. I mean, he's such a lovely man anyway. Yeah. And he, he has this line, he says, the world ordered- a stand-up comedian, you got to honor that. As the person, like it said to you, you're a stand-up comedian. You were like, great, yeah. I'll try my absolute hardest to and be the, great at it. The other stuff is kind of a side hustle. The other stuff that showbiz brings along. But the great thing about being a comedian is we're in show business, but we're not in show business. Yes. Like, like Carlin look, said to Rock one time, I'm not in show business, I'm a comedian. It's a great line. It sure is. Well, we're showbiz adjacent. We get to go to the parties, but no one is, is, you know, if you've ever been with real famous people, you go, people lose their minds around them. It's a security people, issue immediately. Yes, we're, we're like, we don't need security. We can travel commercial. We're absolutely fine. And, and I'm, you know, and listen, I'm saying that here, and I imagine most people that listen to this listen in America and will go, well, of course you can. You're literally just a man. I'm yeah. a big deal elsewhere. I'll have you know. <laughs> travel. I'm a big deal. Um... Okay, let's get into some blocks. Stuff on here I didn't know. Okay, which go, is great go ahead. for a five-year relationship. Enmeshed. Enmeshed. Uh, very, very close to my mother uh, growing up. And uh, How come? I think my uh, father was not. And so it, there's almost like you become a, uh, a substitute spouse. You become very close yeah. emotionally with your parents. He was not around or he was um, emotionally not around? Emotionally not around. You become very close to your, I became very close to my mom. Uh, and so that was a huge part of my childhood and adolescence and growing up. I mean, it really kind of follows you through. She died when I was about maybe 26. And that, that grief is a huge part of my sort of life and was a big turning point in terms of sort of pushing the fuck it button on ah. going. I had a uh, separation anxiety in my life. My biggest fear was my mother um, leaving. There was an incident when I was, uh, I think it was three and my mother's twin died. Mm -hmm. And so she had to leave to go to the funeral. No one really sort of told us what was going on. And we kind of left with our father for a couple of days. And I thought, you know, that thing with kids, you, th you think it's forever. Yeah. It's object permanence is what they call it. That you can, they, you it's why see. people play peekaboo. Yeah. They go, I am here. Or I'm gone, and then you go, yeah, and, the, and then you go, ah, I, no, I'm, I never leave. Yeah. I am always with you, even when you can't see me. I think the the sadness of that death, which I wasn't aware of, but you get the- You feel it. You feel, you feel it, and you don't know what you're feeling. You don't know what's going on, but you go, oh, something's shifted. Something's yeah. sort of changed in this. The sadness of that, and then her being away, I was kind of always very worried about that. And mm -hmm. so when she died, it was the worst thing. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, grief How is, did you, okay, well, let me ask this. Was it- so maybe the boundaries weren't great, meaning if she takes you on as a surrogate spouse, probably not the healthiest no, thing for a mother to do. I know far too much about everything. Far too much. Middle-aged woman's bodies uh, and stuff like that? Every, everything. I know way, way too much about that. So, great. But always you know, had great relationships with, I, I think, probably- But she, you, she, you palpable love. Oh, and was so fucking funny. Had like ah, fuck. incredible charisma, was incredibly depressed. I always think the only question to ask a comic, and really I think you should open with it every week on the show, if I had one note, which of your parents was sick? <laughs> every comic we know, everyone you've ever had on the show, which of your parents was sick and you had to make it okay? Yeah, I mean, terrible, that's a, that really is like Terrible the atmosphere thing. in the house. Yeah. How are you going to learn how to change the atmosphere? How are you going to learn yeah. to, the thermostat is very cold. You need to make things a bit warmer yeah. and nicer. I remember really clearly as a kid, like, my mother was cooking some, maybe Christmas or whatever. And I said, I'm going to go and watch this thing. She said, whoa, 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 whoa. You stay there. And I went, I'm not doing anything. She went, vibes. You're there for vibes. You're making this all okay. And, and that thing of like, you, you fulfill that role. You're a mascot. And then you slightly go, well, I, you know, you're drawn to doing that in, yeah. in adult life. But she was incredibly funny. And no sense of kind of embarrassment and was uh, a larger than life kind of Irish woman um, from Limerick. Nora was her name. Great. Just a wonderful, a, you know, a great company. And then 
I thought it was just so normal. You always think your life is so normal. Yeah. So you think getting home from school and your mother still being in the dressing gown and and, and hasn't got up and uh, hasn't got herself together cool. and isn't taking care of herself physically. Mm -hmm. You kind of you don't want to give anyone a hard time. It's kindness in the moment where you let it go and you never question. Like, why are you not taking care of yourself physically? Why are you not? Are you aware that you're that a, a, a an adult is supposed to, or you don't even know that that's what adults do? I think do? you. I think you do when you you start to be more aware of the outside world. Maybe it's from well, yeah, you go to friends' seven, houses, seven to fourteen. You yeah. see their house. You see how they're how they're living, and it seems different. Uh, but also, it will seem less fun. People always came to my house. Oh, I remember having this thing of like, so you didn't have that thing where you were ashamed of bringing people back. No, like I would have that thing of like. I would get home to my house. I remember like being at university and getting home and my friends, sort of Giles and Phil and, and, and Gerard. Being those are my, not just random British no, no, names. Those, those, those are, real are people. actual friends. And Hiroshi. Uh, <laughs> being in my house, having, like, having, like I'd get home and they'd be at home having coffee with my mum. And you'd go, well, You didn't invite them? No, they were just, like, everyone would just drop by each other's houses or whatever. But you, got it. you'd go, well, But I'm, well, we're just chatting. Fine. You got her an hour ago. Don't worry about it. Do you feel Chatting proud away. of your mom in that? Yes. Like could right. hold her old was like super, super fun. You're super close. She's a bit of, you guys are probably the co-life of the party. It sounds like. Yeah. I think we, we, we had a great time. The, the, the block on that is I didn't have any relationships growing up at school and college. Didn't have friends. Any, you did no, not. Lots of friends. Lots of, lots of girls I got on with. Never really had a girlfriend. Was up. it a f what did because you looking, didn't want to replace her? And looking back on that, I think that was the I was slightly blocked from that because of a very close relationship with it. Kind of no one was good enough, and it was there was kind of a it, it, it was a slight it's a slightly weird thing being enmeshed. It slightly feels like maybe a little bit too close there to to let someone else in. So you know that's that was that was an issue I think growing up. Did, was it a thing that? you were aware of in the time or you yeah i was i was kind of was aware that there was kind of something missing there something kind of i mean i also think i mean to be honest with you when you kind of look back at high school as well i think it was that thing of i i grew up in an era where it was very um what would you say unenlightened in terms of uh courting like so guys kind of had to were kind of pushing it with girls a little bit and yeah. i was very very uncomfortable with that um dynamic always so you got a, a probably probably a good thing in some respects. Yeah, it was just, it was pretty gross. Yeah, and very drunken and very, you know. Yeah. I was tiny and like at parties, I'd be like trying to sc score, what we used to call score yeah. with women. Sure. <laughs> and it was like, I remember girls like physically overpowering me. Of yeah. like, you're not, no, you will not do that, which is so yeah. fucking, I'm so tiny. I wonder with that as well, with the, you know, growing up in that, in that era, the, I, I mean, you end up having lots of, you know, it's fun growing up and you don't feel quite comfortable in your own skin. You don't really become yourself. I think it's like, I don't think people talk about this enough. Your mind isn't developed fully till you're about 25. Yeah. And I really felt that switch. Which we didn't know until like eight years ago yeah but it really makes sense to me it really makes sense of like going there's such a hurry to get to some place to make all your big decisions before you're 25 and it's a race and you go well no you know get yourself an education you know but yeah. but everyone is an autodictat right everyone is no one is still using the education they got it just needs to give you a love of learning even doctors like the best doctor you know ask him how much he's using that he learned at medical school if it's anywhere more than 10 percent yeah, the guy's a, a dummy. Go not to a different a, doctor. Not a good doctor. They're yeah, constantly it's a bit like we're always learning the last war. You know, like it's like the the you fight the last war. Like right. you fight in Iraq, you fight with the stuff you picked up in Vietnam. Right, and yes. it, so it's always like well, it's always old politicians are trying to fight the last election. You never yeah. get to fight yes. that one again. Yes. you always have to go with the, your your ability to learn and 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 pattern recognition, which is what comics kind of our superpower. Yeah. is is what gets you there. What's it like when you go to university with your mom? Pretty, pretty uh, yeah, pretty, pretty good. In I mean, close touch too, or was it very the first close time you were touch, not in the same house? Close touch, but like, um, you know, she didn't take good care of herself. She died when I was 26 of pancreatitis, uh, which was a, a gallstone. I mean, it's really silly. No, gallstone's not that serious, but if you don't get it treated straight away and it was the wrong side of Christmas, she wanted to wait till after Christmas and one burst and... You get the uh, you know pancreatitis, which is a horrible way to go. It's like nine months of agony. Is, it's go. it's cancer or it's no just no it's pancreatitis. Your, your pancreas just blows up, and you can't. And normally it's for clean alcoholics it up, get it. so to speak. Normally alcoholics get it. So I imagine quite a lot of it in your family. I'm the guy, just saying. The guy, the guy does listen. Yeah. Uh, 
and was she bedridden at, like very bedridden at that point yes yeah, she was in intensive care the whole time she we had like two three conversations for nine months she was on a um i mean actually the the staff at the hospital were fantastic because it's mm -hmm. it's all about at that stage um they say there's no such thing as euthanasia but there is so they, they a, put a them, form of it well they put them on on a on a level of so she would have had an epidural for the pain um, and then it just gradually sort of shifts up to where your lung function goes to nothing. So there's a, you know, they tell you sort of, you know, five hours in advance, six hours in advance of the death. Oh, it's going to be today. It's going to be this time. And yeah. they do, you know, the week before it's going to be next week. Yeah. And, and it's, and they're it's weird as well the on... way the mind, I remember on the first week there, I met a young doctor and the doctor went, yeah, this is just, there'll be, there'll be ups and downs, but this is, this, this is, is it. it. This is it, man. And that was very kind of him. I totally forgot the conversation. I mean, totally blocked it out. For that nine months, you and then, forgot And then went, it. oh, yeah, no, that guy said, oh, yeah. Um, and then it's a weird thing with grief. When you know it's coming, you know they're going to die, and then they die, and you go, ah. Oh. Okay, so when she dies, around the time she dies, did you feel a little liberated or total devastation? Uh, very liberated. It was the, um, and totally devastated. But the, the liberation was more like, oh, the, the thing I feared since I was a, a baby had happened, and it didn't matter. Nothing mattered. The, it's, so the, you've the, escaped from from jail in a way. Well, the, but the ability to go out and do what you wanted to do and not care what anyone else thought. So a lot of me going to Cambridge, a lot of me like getting into the best university and doing well and getting all my exams and things was to. She used to refer to me in the in the biblical term of like she got religious when she got older, a very Catholic, and uh, she would refer to me as my son in whom I am well pleased. In kind of an ironic kind of fun yeah. way, but like she was really proud of that. It really meant a lot to her. Like the the bragging rights for parents. Your kid getting into Cambridge means so much more than for the kid. For the kid, right. it's like I went to university in the 1950s. Like everyone else was partying and doing ecstasy at university, and I was having sherry at a drinks party. We're going, the fuck is all what? Yeah, it was it was a weird place to go. And like everyone there is sort of having the same experience? Every, or... Everyone there, I mean, it's where I believe they invented imposter syndrome in Cambridge University because everyone gets there and goes, but I was the smartest kid in my school. Right. The fuck? And then we'll come on to talking about my education naturally flows from this. Of like, I was pretty learning disabled as a kid. Put a pin in that. What's the best way to learn a language? Immersion. Living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching, so you're ready to practice what you've been learning in the real world. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove that Babbel's better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 10 million subscriptions sold, plus all of Babbel's 14 language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Again, I've been going to Spanish-speaking countries. A lot of went to Spain, go to Mexico fairly often. Babbel has helped me. You use the app, and then you're at a restaurant, and you just are like, ¿Dónde es el baño? Like super things, like where's the bathroom? Like it's just shit you're going to need. It's easy to learn like how to order food, ask for directions, speak to merchants. It's about a having a little bit of confidence. I always say the sign of being able to speak a language is mumbling it. And Babbel can get you there. You have to bring your own mumble, but I can teach you the mumble. Here's a special deal for my listeners. Right now get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash B-L-O-C-K-S. Get 55% off at Babbel dot com slash B-L-O-C-K-S, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash B-L-O-C-K-S. Rules and restrictions may apply. So I, I would think that you now are your proclivity is to get enmeshed with women. I, uh, I mean, you're married, so. Yeah, it, no, I'm, I'm not married. Uh, yeah, or I'm, you're yeah. together. But the, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that thing of like, I've got a pretty great relationship with, uh, with my other half, but you go, I don't think it's particularly affected that going forward. I don't think I've like carried it into um, adulthood, but. I don't, it would be I, professional relationships. If you're, because you're, you have a person, it would, the only place, the only other place you could do it would be at work, right? Or I, I think, guess just personal I, no, friendships. I think maybe in friendships or whatever. I like to think that I'm, I'm. I suppose the 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 everyday parlance would be ride or die. If I'm your friend, I'm your friend. Yeah, and I've got you. I've and, I've experienced it. Yes. And and that and that's and I view that as and an I incredibly kind of feel important yeah. part of life. And and when people let me down, then I really feel that it doesn't happen very often. 
But if I get let down or I feel betrayed, it's like, ah, just I'm not. That's We got into a good habit early where if you did something that I was out of bounds, yeah, I, I can I, think of two times yeah, and you great. immediately, one of them I wasn't even done saying. Yeah. And you were like, I know. And it was very heartening for me. And and we had one like last week about a joke. So and you were not, very not like a joke it was a point. Yeah, it was a point. I don't yeah. do jokes. It was, no, it was a really it was a really good point. And I'd yeah. forgotten that you said it. Yeah, it was fine. And it was like, oh, yeah, that's fine. But it is a very yeah, that thing of like going, we we're good at that, I think, the the checking it. And also yeah, I, I think respecting someone else's like the the fairness wouldn't be as important to me as it is to you. But that thing of like, I respect that's your sort of special skill, I think. I get a lot out of this friendship because I know it's it's on these terms. I don't think it's more mine than you. I think it's shared, yeah. I would say. What was the uh, runoff? What was the downstream effects of the enmeshment with your mother? I know, I mean, it's hard to it's hard to call, I think the- Right, because um, we have so many inputs. And but like, the, but mm. the uh, you, you don't realize uh, it's a matriarch until they're gone. So the whole thing fractures and there's just boys left. And you go, oh, well, two brothers. Yeah, but boys don't really the birth birthdays forget it, Christmas forget it, like, mm -hmm. all the nice things kind of went for a while. You know, home isn't a, a place; it's a person. So you're homeless for a while, mm. emotionally certainly. So that's that's a that's tough. And then you find that again, you sort of build that again, and 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 find something that's you kind of remake it. You remake what you lost, or and try and make it better. You know, which is you know, you know, now I can I have. Did the relationship with your father change when your mother died? Uh, I haven't seen him since really in any meaningful way. Great. Uh, Not is, really, but great in terms of just conversation. But in terms of, in terms of this podcast, right? <laughs> I mean, it's fucking right. It's Tremendous. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it, yeah. But that's like a whole other, you know. Um, a different episode? Well, it's not a different episode. It's that thing. I mean, it's literally the line that we spoke about. The narcissist line, yeah. which is your line, please. The line is uh, in terms of narcissism, they have the disease, you have the side effects. Jimmy tried to sell that as his. You yeah. can imagine. I mean, it's I I almost I I wrote it, and I kind of think it's yours just because of the accent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so, so that's a bad. That seems like a very bad relationship. Yeah, that's a bad relationship. But then I think it. Well, it's it's not because you go. I think uh, the thing that I got from uh, Alanon and reading a lot of the did Al you go to a lot of Alanon? Didn't, didn't go to a lot. Didn't read go, a lot, but yeah. Read a lot of the stuff and kind of yeah. and really liked it. But that thing of like detaching with love, the, the idea of going, I don't want, I don't, there's no bitterness, there's no sense of you want anything bad to happen. You just go, well, that's not, it's not good for me. I don't want that person mm -hmm. in my life. And so I won't have that person in my it's life. It's hard to get rid of that stuff. It just is. I, 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 I think I've not done it finally, but like I've come to a but then, new. Uh, but then, you know, you stuff with your father, I'm very aware of the is, uh, it, it's, it's tough. And then you're kind of looking for, to fill that hole you're looking to kind of mm -hmm. replace that who are we trying to impress yeah what and were you trying to it seems like you were trying to impress your mother yes much more so yes is it one of those things where you think if i still mother... find myself now when i do things going oh she would have thought this was cool like yeah. playing carnegie hall or something like yeah then going oh this would have been th yeah she, well that's she funny you thought she wanted you to go to cambridge but if she's funny, she would be real pleased with you being a high level comedian. I think so. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a sadness to think that you know she won't see that. But you can't. But there's a bit of you that kind of you know kind of lives on. Yeah, it's spirit. It's yeah. maybe she feels it or you know yeah. or whatever. Okay, so let's get into the the learning disabled. Did you know you were learning disabled? Yeah, but obviously I wasn't the brightest, so not that aware. <laughs> I mean, like I knew socially I was pretty good with everyone else. Socially I was in school and I was at the regular school, but I couldn't read or write. I mean, I just couldn't. How so, old? Maybe 11 when I could write with any level of- um, Acuity. Uh, acuity. But I mean, even then it was like very embarrassed by my handwriting, couldn't really read out in class, could read words kind of um, phonetically. Explain to dyslexia to, to people. Well, I suppose it's that thing where I don't even recognize what it's meant to be like. Like, I think uh, normally people write and they just go, I'm going to write down this thing and just think it and write it. I have to think about every single letter as I write it. Every letter of the word has to go down in, or, so it just takes a lot longer. So my reading speed is slower than my thinking speed. 
So like, I'm much more on, I'm on audible at times three the speed because mm -hmm. that's the speed I think at. Mm -hmm. And I, so I like that. I, like I always books. think it's disrespectful to the author. Everyone sounds like Mickey Mouse to me. Everyone sounds like one of the chipmunks. Yeah. Like the greatest authors in the world sound like chipmunks to me because they're reading so fast. So I listen to everything at very sort of high speed. But, but the- uh, I would like to show you pictures of chipmunks yeah. and ask you what author- <laughs> They represent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, but so it couldn't really write, can't really write that well now. I mean, like, you know, spell check is kind of everything to me. Okay, so dyslexic- I get the thing with spell check where I don't even know what you're shooting for. Like spell check just goes, like the one it comes up with the word, they, I mean, give us a clue. Use it in yeah. the sentence. Give me more. You were just like, I don't sure. know what it starts with. Like, you, like the, if the words they suggest are like, I don't know what that word is. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? A, a little bit. Like, uh, like sometimes it will be just, I've got absolute sort of blindness on it. I can't see what the word is. Because would what be. happens is, is the middle of the word tricky or the, the front and back? I know. It's the, it's the whole thing. It's like, I wouldn't know where to begin. To, to, and there's certain things I've just got blindness with. The names Susan and Suzanne are the same to me. I cannot see how there's a difference. There's a weird- I, I'm kind of in the same. I think most weird, people are in the same boat. But a weird like- uh, how, a, how could I tell the difference? That yeah, kind of thing? Like, just don't know. And then so, but weirdly then, so couldn't read in class, couldn't write, was kind of a dummy and had to go to special ed. And then it became a massive source of what well, you were drawn towards that. To go, well, I'll, I'll do that. I'll join the debate club. I'll, I'll, I'll show them. And I don't know who I was proving that to myself, presumably. But you, would, you know, now what do I do for a living? Well, I do a couple of TV shows where I'm reading auto cue, which is literally the nightmare scenario: standing up in front of people reading things. New Year's Eve can be a tough time for old people living alone. So what I like to do every year is not think about them because it's depressing. <laughs> do you memorize before? Well, no. Do you? Just, does someone say it to you? Do no, you but I have it, it like. It's written in a really odd style. I got this great tip early on in my career uh, from Anne Robinson, the lady that used to do The Weakest Link. Oh, yeah, yeah. You are The Weakest Link. Goodbye. I met her backstage. She went, oh, yeah, yeah okay. You have trouble with the autocue. What you want to do is this. And you write it as it's... Because spoken English is very different from written English. Yeah. So you put like way, like thousands of commas in everything. So when I write jokes now, thousands of commas, where the pauses are, where the, where the gaps are, like everything really as you would say it. That's fascinating. The phraseology, yeah. And but like properly, like I realize but so I do don't. You, do you only do audiobooks? Uh, pretty much now, yeah. Because uh, I can't universal. think of a better read person than you. Mm. Like you're, ve but you're not. You're not reading. You're listening. Yeah, just listening to stuff constantly. Yeah, I'll do you know three or four a week. I mean, I I love it. Podcasts and audiobooks, and I kind of think that thing of like, you know, I mean, I've said it already, but that ed education being something that like people seem to. It's such a dumb system that we go and then it stops. Oh, I got out of college when I was twenty five. Never read another book. Yeah. What? Yeah, it didn't like, have to. Yeah, uh, there's I don't. I'm not obligated to yeah, do it, so I'm not going to do it. It's like there's a lot of good shit in books, yeah, and, and or audio. You know, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but it, it does feel like cheating to me. But everything feels a bit like cheating. Like the way that I got through my exams. So obviously, I had to do very well in my exams to get to the university mm -hmm. I wanted to go to. So you can't really write that well, but you have to get A grade essays. And how is that done? And really, that was the first kind of thing of pattern recognition in my life. From my friend Pete Maxman, he's a wonderful guy and so bright. And he was the best at history. And my history teacher, crazy old dude, great, went, just read his essays, do that. And so it was like, because you'd read his essay and see how he'd structured it. Okay, all right, well, I, can, I can't I can steal the essay, but I can steal the structure for the, this yeah, other so topic. So back then you couldn't steal? Go so ahead. The, so the, uh, <laughs> but, the, but for, the, for that topic, you could go, okay, okay, well, for the new thing, you can get that structure and you learn what it looked like. And I think the same thing in jokes. I think when you start in comedy, you're looking at your favorite jokes and kind of, I was kind of looking at, why is that so funny to me? Yeah. You know, when I was looking at, I, I don't know, Emo Phillips or Wanda Sykes or Stephen Wright, and either kind of joke to joke, I'm going, well, why is that? Why is that so funny to me? Why is that line, did they start with that and then reverse engineer? And then, and they're almost like crossword puzzles, like, which I always found baffling, trying to reverse them and then getting very into it, like seeing the world in those. And spending as my crossword time. puzzles or joke uh, As crossword puzzles. I think yeah. that's maybe the, cr the closest thing to it. It almost feels like with a great joke, it feels like, oh, the joke was already there. It was there and you just, you cut away everything that wasn't a horse from the marble. Like yeah. That old quote, you know, yeah. kind of, it was, it was in there somewhere. You could get to it. So you're very studied and not, it reminds me of the thing you were saying about therapy, which is, you know, there are different kinds of therapy. There are different ways to learn. Some people learn from hearing someone tell them about it. Yeah. Other people have to read it. There's a Five thing times, called yeah. called uh, 
There's photographic memory. There's also phonographic memory. I think I may have phonographic memory. I can remember, like, if I listen to this podcast, pretty much name an episode, I tell you where I was when I heard it. Yes. L like that thing of, like, I could tell you which airport I was in, what I was doing when I heard that bit that I liked. And I would argue that we're very good at quoting jokes flawlessly. Yes. Because you, you hear you, a joke and you go, uh, uh, okay, I can, da -da, uh, 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 uh. And then that's how yes, some the the rhythm of that the the the, the pacing of it the yeah you, yeah you you would be harder to get it wrong. I I had to look up phonographic memory because I was like I'm good at remembering the and I was like oh I can yeah I now I get it like if I could listen to an audio thing but that's and then not I think other people have it like in a in a different way as well because you know the singers I know that have like the lyrics just it's just in there somewhere yeah. And are you, do you take any pride in that? Or is it just like survival? What the, uh, you know, I was learning disabled and, oh, oh, and sorry, then I got sorry. an Oxford. I, I, did I mention that you, you said it, right? You, you're one of the most well-read people I know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that I'll remember because I'm so embarrassed mm -hmm. at my lack of intelligence that I spend my life overcompensating or compensating for it. So I read a lot and I, uh, I study a lot and I, I think I got my work ethic from being a dummy. So mm -hmm. you go, well, I feel like I didn't deserve to be at that university. I feel like I, that, that, was a, that place should have gone to someone else and I better make this work. I better, I better do my best here. I better. And you weren't and... any sort of charity case. It wasn't like Ooh. this guy is not, <laughs> they, don't they, read. they, they don't, charge. Uh, Cambridge in the nineties did not do that. They, they, this, you had to be, uh, you had to be pretty good. And it was a very, I mean, it was a great course. It was really interesting. Okay. But what I'm saying is, are you happy? The, uh, do you take pride in the fact that it was in, over... I don't know, age 11 to 17, you really dug deep and figured it out? Yeah, I think I had a massive advantage in that when I was 16, I, I changed schools. And I don't think you ever get to beat your environment. So I, I think the hugely important thing for me was going, okay, I was 16, doing well at school, had my friends at that school um, at, who I loved, but they were just funny and we're just fucking around and yeah. drinking and getting into trouble. And we scraped through our exams and we're going to stay on to do the next bit, the last two years of school. And I left, I went to another school and it was my mother went, oh, there's this other school. One of your friends goes to that we know from the village and it's a bus ride and a train ride and it's miles away. Do you want to go? Yeah. Why did you want to go? Because I kind of had a sense of not wanting to be, I knew what track I was going down mm -hmm. and I didn't like where it was going. I went, oh, okay, I'll go a different way. So I remember arriving there the first day and there was one other new kid, this kid Giles. And we went, oh, let's, I, I want to go to Cambridge. Mm. I wanna, and we both went, yeah, okay. And no one laughed. No one kind of went, hmm, what are you talking yeah. about? And it, was re it really felt like, oh, okay, well, well maybe, maybe we're those kind of guys. And there was a couple of great teachers. There was a, um, this guy called Mr. Clay and Mr. Farr, who were like the, the, and they were just fantastic. They just kind of believed in us. And it was, it was that, that thing of like the real cliche of going, well, that turned on a sixpence because then you were sort of down that road and you had more, you know, you have to give the world irrefutable evidence you are who you say you are. And it was that thing of like, okay, well, if I work hard at this, it pays off later. And, and that, that does that inform everything? Everything in your life for the I next I think so, yeah. I, mean, I think it's, it's the thing I've only kind of realized recently about, that's the whole of religion is that. The, ho the whole of religion is prioritized later. God is a, yeah. uh, an analogy for the future. Work hard now, there's a great afterlife. Now, I don't believe in an afterlife, but I do believe in a next life. And if you work hard now. Oh, a next living a, life. A next life. Like, yeah. there's a life that you've had, like, you don't recognize yourself from 15 years ago. You're a different person now because you, you put that work in and it's, you know, so the gifts you give yourself in the future, the idea that, you know, if you go and work out, you have a great body when you're 60. If you save the money now, you'll have, you'll be a rich man later. Delayed that, gratification del is what The God marshmallow is, test is what, is what we're obsessed with. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that whole thing is like, prioritize later is every self-help book you've ever read, every religion you've ever heard about. It's always... Do the work now and it'll pay off later. You know, it's interesting. It's, I don't think I mentioned the marshmallow test on here. The marshmallow test being they put a five-year-old in a room by themselves and they say, I'm going to put a, an adult says, I'm going to put a marshmallow on the table and uh, I'm going to go away for five minutes. If I come back and you haven't eaten the marshmallow, I'll give you a second marshmallow. And biggest single predictor of success in life. Yes, is that not everyone's taken it, but all of in the t times they've done it, the longitudinally, the kids who didn't eat the marshmallow in the five minute window have better life outcomes, which yeah. is just like, well, then there it is. It's just, can you delay gratification? 
then you can, can you save money? Can you do hard work? Can you, with very little reward, it's stand up, you but suck, then and then, you get I mean, no the, money, and then you just stick what you can take it. The downside is you get into kind of a philosophical thing. Not the downside, but the interesting thing, I think, is it's not the pursuit of happiness. It's the happiness of pursuit. Mm. Having stuff isn't fun. Getting stuff is fun. That's kind of life. That's a great life lesson, I think. They're going, you think you'll be happy when you won't, you'll just need a new challenge. I think yeah. we work very well with purpose. So it's that thing I was slightly lost in my, you know, post-college, early 20s, mid-20s, like trying to find what I wanted to do pre-comedy. It was like quite a lost period of like, I, I don't know. Your mom died at 26? Yeah, about 25, 26, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you I felt like comedy, a, kind of. a new, it was like a period on a, the sentence of a life. And you were like, okay, or in your case, a comma. And you start, you're like, okay, now there's no observers. This is how I feel when I'm in Asia, which is I like going to Asia because no one, I, no one's looking. No one, I, it feels like you're they're, hiding they're, from America. They're all looking at you. And well, they're, they're all, all looking. One. Yeah. But, but no one's, well, there's no. a sex tourist. <laughs> That's all they're all thinking. I did a joke. Whenever I'm there, I do. I was like, yeah, I'm a sex tourist pretty much everywhere I go. If I go to Whole Foods, I'm like, I'm still a sex tourist. <laughs> I don't have to go to Asia. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's. I like the idea of a of a duo uh, or a startup. And that over. thing of like, we are who we are when nobody's watching. That lovely thing of going, well, if you're on your own, who who are you really? And finding someone you can be yourself with, like properly yourself, is, is very unusual. I'm also in life. very highly uh, sensitive to perceived judgment. Like we're what happened with the studio wasn't available. We got here or, or whatever. We the times were fucked up. We went and got coffee. We are in my car. We're in my house. And the whole I'm not doing like exactly like flinching but i just assume the judgment is in your head it's like what kind of house is this what kind of, what kind of car is this but you know and so even you're not judging i just assume you're judging yes but it's that um what's the quote it's the in our 20s we think uh we worry about worry about everyone thinking about us in our 30s we think i don't care what everyone thinks about us in our 40s we realize they weren't thinking about us the whole time At everyone all. is just doing their best yeah we are in a windshield flying past each other but then it's a it's a it's a something's got to motivate you right something's got to be the thing that and some with you it's the perceived slight is the is the thing with me it's like you know okay well i thought i was a dummy so i'm gonna have to work hard and do yeah. this and then maybe a little bit of insecurity is why I'm a joke to joke comic. That really appeals to me of going, I've just got to get to the next laugh quick. It's the observation I had of like, I come into every conversation five points down mm. and I have to like, okay, ah, ah, and I'll do gossip if I'm really bombing, like, ah, ah, here's a piece of gossip, or here's a name drop, or here's a, cause I don't think I'm doing well. And I don't, I don't think I'm enough. So I have to come in and- yeah. I remember having that realization with Joan Rivers, uh, we got to work with before, uh, before she passed and she was doing we were taking her to dinner like so that she was on our show in the uk and like a proper actual legend i mean one of the yeah and she was making notes one of the absolute greats making notes in a hotel room before the dinner for the dinner like cue cards so she would have bits about topical stuff that she could throw in for a dinner with a bunch of what of course and why was she one of the greats well because of that the yeah. thing driving that now, this weird thing with you know, in our industry, you know, it's a, we've said it before, we'll say it again, comparison is the thief of joy. It's you're always looking at what other people are doing. Everyone always wants what you've got. They never want to do what you had to what do you to did. get it. Yeah. And not just the hard work, the emotional world. The torture. What you had to feel. I just, I'm editing my special. The watching yourself over and over and over is a recipe for an abyss. It's d direct, just go like... Well, the, I mean, the physical, we can come on to that now if you want. The the physical thing of going, being on screen or whatever, having a, uh, just, you, you look how you look. No one cares. No one's come to see my show because of how I look. Yeah. And yet it becomes obsessive. The idea of uh, taking care of yourself and being the right weight and being uh, properly groomed at all times. It becomes just a, a compulsion. Hey, if I asked you how many subscriptions you have to anything, would you be able to list all of them and how much you're paying for them? Cable, phone, gym memberships, any of it. Could you name them? If you would ask me this question before I started using Rocket Money, I would have said yes, and then I would have tried and I would have been wrong. I would have undercounted. There was one app, I won't name it, but it was magazine, articles, audio. I was paying 10 bucks a month for that. 
to hear magazine articles. Dating apps, not Neil, not great. You, you don't need them, Neil. Couple dating apps, three. It makes me sound thirsty, but please, ladies, you know you know where to reach me. Another speech thing. Just, I had a lot of garbage. Yeah, and the other thing that it does is it takes, like, ones where you have to call and, like, call again. To, they take care of it for you. Like, you do nothing. The I had a gym membership that was a nightmare. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills overall. Rocket Money has 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash N-E-A-L. That's R-O-C-K-E-T-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash N-E-A-L rocketmoney.com slash Neil. I've got a low level eating thing where I'm very, I think about, I don't have an eating disorder that you would recognize as one of the serious ones. I think about food you a lot. You don't, you said you no, don't. No, I don't. Yeah, I, yeah. I think about food a lot and I'm, I'm, I'm this weight because I'm hungry a lot of the time. I could be bigger, but I feel happy. You were bigger. I feel happy at this weight because I go, well, actually, I, I don't think about it a lot, but I think it's partly my mother passing and not taking care of herself and being a little bit overweight mm. and wanting to take care of myself and be a be a parent for longer. And that kind of, you know, all mortality, I, I think kind of grief is cumulative. You don't just grieve your what you're grieving at the time. It's every time. It's all your grief, I'm assuming. Or is it you're taking on your mother's grief? I think you 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 go well. So when your mother dies, you you grieve. That was the first big loss that I had. But when friends have died since, even pets have died since. Sometimes just it will hit you in a way that you think was that commensurate? Is that emotionally? Um, yeah, I know them well enough to get your friend to Sean died. Comedian. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, uh, A. Gill died. I mean, it was a, it was really bad. Uh, but but some, uh, my my dog died about six weeks ago. One of my dogs that I had for fourteen years and was Mackie was beautiful, beautiful dog. And he passed and it was, you know, we did it really beautifully at home when the vet came to us. But all the grief from the past comes back and you think about your own mortality. It's mm. a cumulative thing. And I think somehow the controlling, you know, anyone that goes to a doctor should be consulting a chef first. Mm. It's that, that thing of like what you're putting in there. It has important. consequences. Yeah. Has consequences down the line. We don't say that a lot because we want to be kind to people in the moment. To your mother, for instance. The, or, yeah, you yeah. want to be kind in the moment. Whereas I sort of my not theory, but I think kindness is incredibly important, but it's got a temporal element to it. You want to be kind in the future. So being a parent kind of teaches you, you want to be kind to your kid, but you don't want to buy them McDonald's every you day. You don't want to be so kind that it is a disservice. Yes. That you, you, you go, well, you could give in to them all the time. They want to watch TV and eat junk food. That's what they want. Yeah. And you go, well, no, you're going to, you know, we're going to pretend to be different people than we are for the next 15 years. Pretend we love broccoli and reading books. Yeah. And that's the, and that's how you that's will grow parenting. up. And then at one stage we'll go, ah, yeah, we love McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, I have a hard time with that. Meaning I am very quick to go to judgment or go to like, well, if you really want to know if you, you know, I have a friend who's having a drinking problem and I'm, I'm saying, yeah, you can feel Sorry for yourself. You can talk about all the things that have been done to you. Can you stop drinking? Because it's going to do a, it's going to do huge damage to you if you don't stop. And, and I, but at the same time, like, I think I've been empathetic in the past, but now it's a bit like, hey, if you want, I also can't take on uh, somebody like, can you kind of help me with this? I'm like, if it's drinking, I can't because I'll get too codependent and I'll get too forceful and I'll get too, worried and if you drink i'll get super disappointed and judgmental of you and so that is interesting of like where do you draw the line with kind of where does where does where does what's the when does kindness become kind of yeah toxic for a lack of a what's that word. what's that book the uh this uh this something mind this naked mind okay this naked mind is a really good book because if aa doesn't work for you and for a lot of people, it just sort of doesn't. Yeah. It's not their thing. So they go, well, I'll get California sober and just do yeah. marijuana or whatever. Or, uh, you know, this book's really good because it's it's the John Sarno, you know, the guy healing back pain or the mind-body connection. Yeah. Really interesting books on like back pain and how most of it's emotional in our society. The, the thing on his book, uh, Dr. Sarno, is you read the half the people you. read the book and their back pain goes away. Well, here's this guy. Uh. 
I've read the book. I was in Lisbon. Just listened to it. Walked around Lisbon. Had back pain. He said in the book, oh, the back pain will transfer into your shoulder for, for like a day and then it will go. Like it might pass through some of the bit of you. Woke up with a frozen shoulder uh -huh. and then gone. And just, oh, okay. I know what that was about. Great. What was it about? It was about my relationship with my father. Yeah. But it was like, it was just gone. Like, oh, okay. I've, all right. You kind of acknowledge that. And you, it was so quick and so, it was kind of, it almost felt like, I feel like, uh, a, a hippie kind of saying it of like, you know, read this book. It's certainly worth doing before you get the back surgery. Yeah. Before you get your scoliosis treated, uh, read the book. Because I brought it up on this podcast, for how long did you wake up every morning at the same exact time With and a panic go, attack? Oh, how, yeah. how long did that last? Maybe seven years. Seven years. I used to wake every up morning. 4 a.m. to panic attack. Yeah. That was pretty bad. That was bad. Seven years. Did you that, do, yeah. were you doing anything to counter it? that time not really no i think it's like it's panic attacks are weird because you can i had one on stage in in australia once and i was like in front of four thousand people and the gig went great and i had a panic attack and it's I did know, you I had, say you were having a panic attack no uh i and did you listen I, back to the got, performance we've got panic attack stories right the um <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah. we do um, i the, should tell the story no finish it and then okay I'll tell so that. so the panic attack like if, if you haven't had one fabulous and I, I, you never need to experience it. Yep. But if you, the first one is the scariest. After that, they're, they're okay. The first one is like, I can't you get comfortable You have no in idea what's happening. Skin. Yeah. I, I, I can't stand up. I can't sit down. I don't want to eat. I'm hungry. I want to sleep. I'm not tired. I, like, it's everything. It's incredibly uncomfortable. But you can function through it. There's no sense of, ah. And I thought it's, there's something about my voice and the way that I present myself, where if I say I'm very insecure and that's why I tell all these jokes and I, I, I don't, I'm not very self-confident and I think I'm a dummy, there's something about my voice where you go, you can hear it on one level and another bit of you is going, no, yeah, fine, very successful British man, don't worry about it. Yeah. But, but you have to be aware of how the world perceives you and then mediate between the two. It feels like, that, you know, sometimes like me having a panic attack because I don't sound like I'm having a panic no. attack. So, okay. Did, did did it start? Well, I on think Caroline stage? is often surprised. Mother half is often surprised if I go uh, feeling a bit down. Yeah, you, you seem fine. Yeah, what are you talking about you're like an emotional. Uh, are they called Bobbies? The guy who stand well, in front of the, the the Overton window of my emotion is 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 that like you can get the, you know you get given a Netflix special and so you're filming it. It goes great. It's a huge deal, and I'm oh good, and then you know something uh, your friend died. Oh, okay, it's like. Are you talking about that's what people's expectations are or that's what your that's experience That's kind of how, that's how I present. It's yes. not how I feel. I feel overjoyed and I feel sorrow, but I think I present fairly. Yeah, steady. Yeah. You're like the guy who stands in front of Downing Street. Mm. The soldiers who won't, the fur hat yeah. and all that shit. My panic attack story involving Jimmy was, so it's fairly laborious in terms of how I started having them. Had started having them two weeks before three mics and then I went, on Zoloft after that, they stopped. And uh, and then I'd stopped taking Zoloft again. I'm in London with Dave Chappelle and J Jimmy's there, uh, at, came to the show, and it was Dave's show. And I go on stage, uh, here's what happened. Trevor Noah had told me that people in England just heckle freely <laughs> as like part of the show. So I, I'm like, fuck, it's the same theater I think he did. And I'm like, I'm fine. Like, and, and Cena, Dave's robe yeah. was like, hey, you got to go out now. And I was like, what? And then I go on stage, James and Jamila are there and I do a minute and I can feel the, I'm getting tunnel vision, can't breathe, can't think. And I was just like, yeah, mm, hey, Jimmy, come, come on out. And I go, Jimmy Carr. And he go, they're very happy to see you. And I go backstage, catch my, it's once I, it only takes about 40 seconds to but clear my body, but it, like, I don't know yeah. time. Yeah. Of course. And then you brought me back out and I did a good set. So, yeah. but it was like, it was kind of unfortunate, but I could tell. Like tag team, tag team wrestling. Yeah. Um, so, so I understand panic attacks. Now I take a beta blocker and they, I, I get none I, before I go on stage. Oh, right. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, I kind of don't like medicating. I, I, I kind of not like, I like to feel my feelings. I like to kind of go, okay, well I'll, I'll feel that. And I, as long as it's not 
really bad. Like I got beta blockers one time when I got cancelled. I got uh, I got some beta blockers. It was the, the the tax thing that I had like in twenty twelve. Jimmy's had two scandals: taxes oh, and a, and, a, a me- and a many scandals in between. Not all of them make it to the states. Got it. Okay, I get, I get canceled about about every two years. There's there's an incident. Great. Uh, normally a joke, which is fine, you know, because yeah. you've got to right size. I told a joke. Some people didn't like it. Yep, that's kind of okay. Uh, but when it's a big thing, the tax thing really felt like oh, this could be not an existential crisis, but this could end your career or could change it. And I got beta blockers. I remember taking one the first day. I think, oh, okay, everything feels all right. And they just had them as a as sort of a talisman. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, they're there if you need them. Don't need them. Right, but, but weirdly, you'd rather, yeah. I use Downton Abbey. Go I think on. it has the same effect as Valium. It's a very chill show. Yeah. Nothing shocking is going to happen. I found it very calming. So what you do you watch? Kind of, hadn't an watched episode? any of them. Hadn't watched any of them. And then watched those like for like 10 nights in a row. Watched the season. I just really found it very kind of grounding. I don't know why, but sometimes it's like that thing of like, what are you going to go to? When you're feeling like going, well, people use, use comedy that. for that. Yeah, I think a lot of people use comedy for that. Okay, so what are the you, you wrote anxiety disorder counterfactuals? What does that I mean? I spend my life like when I wake up at four in the morning in a panic attack. Partly it's the physical thing, but, but and that's gone now. How did really you get rid of it? I, I think having kids had a had a huge effect on that. So, so there's something more important than you in the world, and that changes your outlook on life. Um, just in a very positive way for me. I mean, I really wanted kids. I was really excited about the prospect. And then it's You kept saying, it's please delivered. get me pregnant. Yeah. And so. it's, it was so hard on those walks. Um, the, the, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's like, I mean, it really feels like it's that, that thing where you're not the priority anymore. And it's that last stage of uh, growth. Where you yeah. Go, well, okay, it's well, your, I oh, I'm not a big deal. Okay. Yeah. It's like, you don't worry about it. But you do, there's a, there's almost like the, the, uh, you know how the big bang, you can still hear the sound from the big bang in space. They, they, oh, yeah, there's yeah. a rumble from it. There's a low level rumble of anxiety with having a kid that no one talks about. And it's the counterfactuals. Like I'm not worried about falling off a cliff. I'm worried about jumping. I'm not worried about, let's see, you spend your life thinking about things that haven't happened, won't happen, but you're constantly thinking about something bad could happen to the kid there. Something bad. So every new, is it all based on it happening to him? Everything with the kids is about something bad could happen to him. So every news story becomes a, well, what would you even do if that, if, if something happened? It's, it's, it is that thing of, uh, I can't remember whose quote is the, it's like having a medical procedure where your heart lives outside of your body. That does feel what it's like. Do you ever worry about, uh, dying and abandoning, abandoning him, stuff like that? Or you have two kids now? Mortality feels like it's a become a much bigger deal it just based on like i don't want to hurt him i yeah, if like I, I die because it's if fine you're, if you're if you die and you leave your partner you go well yeah I, i'd want them to be upset for a reasonable amount of time but please 10 years go love again i would say like anything over two weeks i'd be thrilled like it, honestly I, I you should find someone else she's super funny. oh i don't want her to not find somebody. super funny super great give it a, give it yeah. a couple of years but hey, warren zevon keep me in your heart for a while that yeah. song sums it up beautifully think yeah. of me occasionally great but the but now with kids, you oh my god, you've got to make it through for them. Yeah, we just talked before about having a kid, and what's been. Yeah, you're a, one of my many friends who's had a kid and loves it. Yeah, tell me more about loving it. I think it's the it's tickets to the greatest show in the world because it's like uh, an, uh, uh, the emotional experience of like that bandwidth that I have of like the joy to sadness. The idea kids are, so you, when you're with them, you're, I'm not great at meditating, but when you're with kids, you're in that moment with them and there's nothing else. And it's kind of phones away and you're just kind of, you're playing with them and it's incredibly fun to see the world And talking eyes. about a show where you're invested in the lead character. Yeah. Pretty big. Yes. Like the investment that you feel for your kid is. And, and getting to know them, like you have the baby and everyone's obviously thrilled with the birth and they, oh, there's a kid and it's great and it's healthy and lovely. And then you get to know them. And everyone with one kid is a nurture. Everyone with one kid will tell you, well, we used oat milk and this kind of special soother and the, these nappies. And so obviously he walked at nine months. Everyone, when they have two kids goes, oh, they come out with factory settings. They, they just, they are who they are. So we, you know, it's, they're different and they're, yeah. they've got, a, they've got their own sense of self. And you sort of see glimmers of that, even when they're sort of one and a half, you sort yeah. of see this person it's just 
it's based the, on their taste, movement, blinking, all that stuff. How they are with you. How yeah. just how they how they interact with Not you. Not speaking even. Not speaking like pre pre-language. You can tell who they are as a person. It's great. I mean, I couldn't recommend it. E okay, so did we I think we covered the eating disorder. Yeah, we we're both pretty I think we're on a similar tip on that. I'd say there's not. Yeah. When I just ma I get mad all of the things I eat that that are over a certain amount hmm. are they just go to my stomach and love handles and it's so it makes me so aggravated. So that's what a lot of my like controlled food stuff is. It's like I know where you're going. So yeah. I have to keep it around a weight uh, past that weight. It's just like and it's it's wrong. It's an injustice. It really is it's just like this is wrong what you're doing on my body. So I just have to keep it within a certain, you know, we won't get into the weight, but yeah, but, uh, but so mine is it's a justice issue. I, I, in a I weird think it's you know we were right? talking earlier about you know there may be maybe too many people talking about mental health on podcasts. I don't know if there are. I don't think men are really the talking male about eating disorders are totally on. I we talk about it on here, but like. For the most part, I never see people talking about it. Hmm. I think maybe it's holding a mirror up because we're on TV, we're on podcasts, uh -huh. and we see ourselves. I think increasingly, everyone is seeing themselves. I mean, remember that thing when we were kids, we were told the people of native South America think if you take a photo, it steals your soul. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, that's some nonsense. Yeah. And now with Instagram, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah, it does. It's, it's not one photo. It's two million photos. Mm -hmm. It's every photo you've ever seen of yourself. So you have this perception of who you are that isn't really you. You never get to see what effect you have in a room when you come in and you're 3D and you affect it. By you the way, you don't get it when you're looking in a mirror. It's no. a reversed image. It's yeah. you ever sometimes they'll have flip mirrors or whatever yeah. they're called. And you see and you're like, oh that's yeah. different. Yeah, it is a weird it also is be everything's a beauty contest because of Instagram and or some kind of contest, which is as a person that's already competitive enough, it's like, I don't want to participate. Yeah. Over there, there's a great book by Will, Will Store called The Status Game. Mm -hmm. Did you read that? Yeah. Uh, I bought it and haven't read it. Oh, I've it, read a few other a great, status like books. Like about that yeah. weird thing about like what that, that force that's going on sort of through life of like you're sort of comparing yourself to other yeah. people and how am I doing? And The work all is my find. You work more than anyone I know. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe probably. Kevin Hart's got you. But like. I think probably has, but but the like this year was three hundred shows, which is that's a lot, and it's difficult to it's difficult to justify because you kind of go well you don't need anything, but it's the enjoyment of doing it. It's partly that thing of like going, this might not last forever. Is and there an Iron Man element of it? Like I can do I can do three hundred shows and they're all good. Yeah, there's a there's a bit of proving something to yourself. There's a bit yeah. of kind of going well. Look, if you write the show. That feels like the tough bit to me, writing the show. Going mm -hmm. and performing it is a pleasure. Yeah. It's a joy to do. And it's slightly different every night and you mess around a bit. And yeah. it's always an enjoyable experience to do the show. And the travel can be, you know, hard on you or whatever. But I I I love doing it. I mean, it's that thing of going, and I think I get to spend more time at home than most parents. How come? Because I work nights. Right, but you like how long were you in Australia? But the kids came to Australia. Okay. So great. it's that thing like the big trips, they come, you're never away more than sort of 12 or 15 days would be kind of the absolute max you'd want to be away and then you'd be home for the same amount of time. When I'm home, I'm home. So when you're home, you're around till, even if I have, the UK is so small, if I'm gigging in Britain, you could, I could leave the house at 4.30 and make it to Manchester for a show at eight. You've got great trains, we've got great transport system, drive back afterwards, be up with the kids in the morning. Yeah. It's, it's like if you Look, if you, if Caroline's fine with it, you're yeah. fine with it. What's there's yeah. no problem. But I think there is that thing of going. There's a there's two things going on. There's one is um, uh, safety. Is there a bear going to attack us? Do we have a roof over our head? Do we have enough to eat? And then one is scarcity. And I think the scarcity thing is like, do we have enough? If it all finishes tomorrow, do we have enough? And I think the reason one day there will be a trillionaire is because for some people, a hundred billion wouldn't be enough mm -hmm. because there's a scarcity thing. So I think there, there's a bit of my mind that goes, oh, you need to, don't turn it down. Are you going to put in a new tour? Yeah, of course we're going to play everywhere again. Of course you're going to go to all those places. Of course, more, more, more. And um, do you keep an eye on that? Well, no, because I mean, it's, it's, it's very joyful. It's like traveling yeah. the world as well. You go, I can't complain about it. I mean, it's like, I really can't complain. It's like, A, I chose it. And B, like the idea of going, I did 50 countries on the last tour. 50 is a, like that's, you saw the world. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Right? And you had your whole day free. 
hanging around and, and seeing stuff. At, and, and, and you get to meet interesting people and ask them interesting questions because you're doing a show that night and you kind of need to know or, you know, whatever bizarre thing it is on that tour. Where are the sluts from? You need to ask. That's often the thing. <laughs> or, or what's the local town? Where would you? Where do you think the inbred people are from? <laughs> yeah, it's yes. often the and they've always got an answer. There's of always all oh, these guys. Yeah, God, I was yeah. just there last night. They said you guys. I like when there's four people and they're all pitching their own. Like, well, they are. Those people are <laughs> super inbred. Yeah. The the I will say that I feel like you've changed in the time I've known you. You've kind of grown, or your values have kind of. The other good thing about the amount of free time we have is like we can think about it. We can think about like what am I doing? There's more there's more self-reflection time. Yes, I think so. I think if you're if you know if you're working two jobs and supporting the family or whatever, there's not a lot of time to be, you know, it being well read is a, a massively privileged thing. Yeah. You've got the and, time for that. Um, yes. so the idea of going, yeah, I think I have changed and grown, but I think that's you know, my favorite question, my, like, if you sit next to someone at a dinner and you don't know them, what, what was the last thing you changed your mind about? Always a great question. Always very interesting to kind of go, well, what's the, are you just rearranging your prejudices? If, if you have the same views you had when you were 25, if I can ask you what you think about abortion, and from that, I know every other opinion you will have. Like, ah, it's kind of not exciting. I like it when people are like, well, what are you on the you. fence about? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what, what, what do you, Peter Thiel has this question, which is what opinion do you hold that would be very unpopular? Yeah. Amongst your crowd. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, in yeah. the world. It's, it's, right. it's really interesting. Oh, okay. That's. And when do you, what's too crazy? Yeah. Where it's like, I think we need to open our minds about what to do about Down syndrome. You know what I mean? <laughs> whatever, the, whatever the thing is that you go, it's. But that's why I think free speech is so important because if you take away free speech, you don't know what people are thinking. And that's more dangerous when it bubbles up. If you don't talk about stuff openly and people don't feel like they have a voice, then it bubbles up in very strange ways. Yeah. And these unexpected sh you know, shocks to people happen. Mm -hmm. You know, People are shocked by, I don't know, whatever, Brexit yeah. or Trump or the level of anti-Semitism in the world now is, is you know, genuinely, it's like, it's a huge issue and it's always been there, but it was, people didn't talk about it. People yeah. didn't engage with that, which yeah. is, you know, it's dangerous. Free speech is, I think, massively important. Yeah, I, I yes, uh, but I have a longer explanation. Like, uh, within, I, I believe in limits, whatever. It's the wrong podcast. Uh, we'll go on Rogan. Right. Um, yeah, so I would like to say that I, you're a, a great friend. Uh, you're a fucking hilarious guy. You'll pitch jokes. I, I, feel, I feel guilt right now for not being funny enough on this podcast. Like, I always feel like it's a different side of yourself you're showing on these things, but like, oh, oh I It's not enough. Okay. It's, but you know what I mean? It's like- you've, Yeah, I'm used to doing it, so, and I also like trade in confession. Like, that's sort of my, three mics and blocks is more but the, confessional. But the, when you watch three mics and when you watch blocks, it is pretty joke to joke. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, there's maybe- More jokey than you think. Yeah, I mean, even blocks, like the, the end of blocks, which is, Great. But like right up until the, like, it's right up until the last moment you go, funny, 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 funny. Okay. Yeah. An emotional close. Yeah. Which you absolutely earned. Right. But it feels like. But I earned it by jokes in a weird way. So it's like, it is, I, I agree with you. Mm. But there's, I, I would, per, I'd like you to be a little, emo not even emotional, but like what you said of no one would believe most of your true setups. Yes. No one That's would believe like I'm insecure. They'd be like, what? Like I don't, I'm I'm against you. I don't buy this but premise. I think, I think again, that's a that's another big thing in the world at the moment where you go, I'm not self authored. I can't tell the world who I am. They write we it. We have to make an agreement. Yeah, it's a, it's a mediation. Everyone, your sense of self is a mediation between you and what the world thinks. And the thing again, the world orders stand up comics. So get on there, tell some jokes, do your thing, and then you you know earning out. Like there's a couple of longer bits in the next yeah. special which you've seen. And, you know, longer bits, which are more confessional, which are yeah. more kind of, you know, open. And it'll go that way a little bit more as I, as I yeah. go. But still, my love language is one-liners. By the way, I, you sent me the special and you, you'd also directed it. And I think I was a little stingy with the praise yes. on directing. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> because I've directed, because I, because I came, I come from writing and directing. So if, and I'm so so much more impressed with being a comedian and having a persona and having a great career 
So you were like, what about the direct? And I was like, ah, I don't care about it. I was like, you're Jimmy Carr. I don't care that you can direct, but I know it's a new thing that you've done. And I should have been more, I shouldn't have dragged you into my point of view. Well, no, I mean, the thing about the direction on it was, I think sometimes stand-up specials can be a tough watch because it's three shots on repeat. Yeah. And I, so I wanted every camera shot to be moving. I wanted everything yeah. to feel like it had like a natural, and it also was moving at kind of 92 beats a minute. Like mm. it felt like it had the energy, the same energy as, as, what was, as what I was delivering and was constantly, you know, moving. I, yeah. I just think it's that thing of like, you're used to watching that in every other genre. Yes. And stand up is quite, can be quite, yeah. okay, I'm wearing that. Uh, what was your great line about? Um, it's Bo Burnham's line. Uh, so good. A, your t-shirt is basically the production design. <laughs> <laughs> like instead of lights yeah. and uh, 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 dynamics and, oh. and curtains and da, da, da. He's like, it's your shirt. We're here most of the time. So yeah. it's just your shirt. Yeah. Um, but having a bit more movement in it, whatever. I think it's better. I, I think it's the best no, thing I've done. I, I agree. Like, but yeah. I'm just saying like, I didn't, I was aware in the, like shortly after the moment. And, uh, and I, that's why I. But I think there's a tendency sometimes when you go, to not say it because you think the person doesn't need to hear it because they're a, you yeah, go, like, well, you're he knows Carr. he's a safe pair of hands. Yeah. He knows he has, you know, two hours of great jokes, but you go, that thing of when we send each other the new stuff, it's always that thing of going, oh, wow. Yeah, no, yeah. I, so I apologize for that. And I, oh, now I, I give you the compliment now. Um, the compliment would have meant nothing if we weren't recording it, by the way. I would have just been. Well, no, it's, what you would have forgotten immediately. Yeah, of course. Um, this what, was great. The, anything, this is, we, anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about? Yes, the Blocks podcast. And the, uh, I don't know how long this is going to run for, but I hope it runs forever. I've so enjoyed it. Uh, it's it's great. Thank it you. It really feels like, and it, kind of every time I listen, I go, I should watch Blocks again. I love doing it. So, and again, oh. it's your idea. So you're enjoying. I, re, I like the basking in reflected glory. I've had to do absolutely nothing. And I've got, so, like, it was basically an idea for a podcast I wanted to listen to. And I've so enjoyed listening to it. Especially, I think. Some of the people I didn't know their comedy that well. Yeah. So I listened and then went and watched two specials off the back of it, which I kind of think is the perfect way because you're so much more invested post this show. Right. Going and watching clips of Carrot Top and going, oh, it's a fucking good joke. Yeah. Like whatever the thing is that you go, yeah. I wasn't aware of his work particularly, but you listen to it and know who he is as a guy. And then We're, you we may it. be going to Las Vegas together. We'll go see him. That'd be great. So that's the mm. new Brennan promise. The U2 Carrot Top double. We'll see if we can get them to open for them. I mean, I, the I think they got to be open to it. They, yeah. I believe they... They should open for him? That's <laughs> something. A... He should do the sphere. Yeah. Um, explode. I mean, please. Um, all right, buddy. You're the. You're such a great guy. You're such a important figure in my life. Thanks, and I, uh, I, I'm, I love you. And it's now it's on film. Okay. Well, I... Uh... This is awkward, isn't it? No, <laughs> I, I, I love you right back. I love you. This is great. Fantastic. Okay. God bless. Jimmy Carr.